I'm happy to announce our first ever members only fishing tournament, the Halloween Bash on Tourney X. The tournament is going to go from October 12th until midnight on Halloween. Registration is open now and it ends Monday, October 14th at midnight. You must be a Patreon supporter to enter this competition. For the $20 entry fee for the tournament, I am guaranteeing $100 for the biggest largemouth caught, $100 for the biggest smallmouth caught, $100 for the biggest rock bass, $100 for the biggest sunfish, and I'll be paying out a first place and a second place, and those numbers will be dependent on how many people sign up. Again, the tournament is $20 for Patreon members only. And to be a Patreon member and to help support Fishing the DMV, it's only $6 a month. And for that $6, which is less than a pack of Senkos or Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Catoctin Creek Rods, They'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, loads of members only content, our monthly photo contest giveaway, and of course, for this month, our Halloween Bash Fishing Tournament. Again, if you would like to join this community and join this really cool fishing tournament, link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aaron. Today, I'm joined by Ben Dalton. Ben, I'm really, really glad we were able to make this happen. How did you, honestly, as we weave this tale today, like what kind of got you into fishing and, and where do you, where's the area of Virginia that do you call home? Uh, I grew up in uh, Danville, Virginia. And, uh, what, what got me into fishing was my, actually my grandparents. Um, I grew up on a farm and had a farm pond there. And actually, I was actually thinking about this earlier. I caught my first bass when I was three years old. Oh, cool. And I caught it and I caught the fish on a grasshopper that I'd caught by hand, which my brother, he was there helping me, of course, but Man, that's where it all started with me, and it's been a downhill slope ever since, I guess you could say. When did you catch the tournament bug? I was 21, so I haven't, I guess in the grand, I'm 34, so I guess in the grand scheme of things, you know, I got into it, you know, kind of late, you know, a lot of these guys are starting a lot earlier than that now, you know, with all the high school stuff, because mm -hmm. the high school, the high school tournaments what they weren't around when i was in high school no it's really more of a, a newer thing honestly like we are the generation that was on the cusp of it because like high school was just getting going when i at my area and of course you know i was at the very beginning of college fishing before it became what it is now which is a juggernaut when you talk about the danville area what kind of lakes did you really crack your teeth on to kind of get started in your career uh bugs island um I think, I think the first time I fished Bugs Island, I was eight. So, so I've been fishing it a while and that was, that was out of, yeah. Um, I fished Smith mountain a lot too. My dad, my dad really liked to fish Smith mountain. I didn't, I didn't particularly like it. Still don't some days. Uh, but yeah, bugs, bugs is where I learned to really like, like fish. Cause yeah, I think you got on that chain is bugs. The first is the first lake in that chain. Correct. It was bugs, Gaston and Roanoke. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no more lakes after that. Have you ever fished Leesville or, or Philpot? I uh, fished both of those. What is Leesville like? Cause I've never talked to someone that's <laughs> fished Leesville a lot. Like the rumors are there's no fish in there. You'll just basically destroy your boat. If you try to drop it in there, like what is that place like? Uh, that like fluctuates a lot. It, 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 it honestly, sometimes it reminds me of fishing a tidal river because the water will move back and forth in it. Like I've seen it. We fished it one day. This has been years ago. I seen it drop like three feet one day. My God, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I don't know what happened there. Gotta love the old internet there. Um, so you were talking about 
at the moment there because I'm time stamping it. Uh, Leesville Lake fluctuates a bunch. It goes from like low tide to high tide. You've seen it fluctuate like three feet in a day. Yeah, I, I haven't fished it very much, and it's been it's been years since I've been on it. And I actually got a little I got a little running joke with my brother in law about that place. You know, you know the best thing about fishing Leesville Reservoir. What is when you leave the reservoir? <laughs> have you actually caught a fish out of it oh yeah yeah and, and um stripers it's really good it used to be you know that's where the state record you know come out of was leesville unless it's been hmm. broken i haven't i haven't checked that in a while but that that's where the standing state record was for a long time was leesville i still gotta check that place out to see what that thing's all about because it's got to help you though does a place like that help you with kerr Hmm. No, that Leesville, Leesville reminds me a lot of field pot, but without the up and down water, it's a lot of vertical banks, you know, and mountain lake is about what it is. And it, it's more of a river channel than anything. It's just a winding river channel. And there's a couple major creeks on it. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. That's really big diversity. Then when you look at Phil pot and then Lee compared to Smith and then all the way, I mean, Kerr is not that far. I mean, it's basically the same river chain that it's created off of with, with that said, I mean, pivoting to, to Kerr, uh, like super high level, like how has Kerr changed over the years or at least growing up as a kid till now? What was that? I, you kind of, how has Kerr changed over the years when it comes to how it fishes? Have you seen differences in it? All right. I think I'm back now. How has Kerr changed over the years? Um, man, it used to be, it used to be a really big offshore, you know, like especially back in the 90s. And one thing that's declined is the last, like, I mean, there's still, but, you know, I, I actually talked to a guy that he fished BASS back in like the seventies and he talked about Kerr and he talked about like all these huge stumps and stuff that were everywhere in the lake. You know, when the lake dropped, you could go and find these stumps and mark them, you know, on a paper map and stuff. And man, you just don't see that. You just don't see that anymore. And about it, you know, Hydrilla was in that lake about eight years ago and mm. man, it fit, it fished really good then, you know, especially for your shallow guys and stuff. And, and the fish quality was better then. Um, but what's, what's face it. I mean, but bugs has got, and if you can catch a four and five pounder, you know, you, you've caught a unicorn. We, we've stated that on the show multiple times where you're like, you have to find one of those unicorns to have success uh, on that lake. And it's crazy to think that it had more stumps and it. it had grass. And now it's like a desert almost, if you will. It's really weird how it's being managed. Um, were the weights better back then? No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember it, it back when the grass was in it. I, I know of there was one April that I fished it and I fished it for four weekends straight and caught over 20 pounds every weekend. That's insane. And the be best day was like 24 something, but from 20 to 24 pounds in four straight weekends. Dude. And it's we just hadn't seen it since we hadn't seen that since honest. Once in a while somebody will crack, you know, 20 pounds, but most of the time it's 16 to 19 and then occasionally a 20 pound bag. Are there any other lakes in the area that you like just to fun fish or is, cause it just seems like that place would be depressing to go to every day. And uh, we had talked about Falls Lake. I mean, I've, I've only been on Falls Lake in Carolina maybe 15 times in my life. And I mean, dude, it's got them. I mean, mm. if you, if you don't have, if you don't have 25 to 30 pounds there, you might as well go home. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's crazy. Was that place always good? Cause I rem honestly, I didn't know about it until like the BPT went there and, and we, had, we got to see them crack it. Yeah. I, um, I, 
about eight years ago was the first time I'd ever fished it, and it was good then. Now, prior to that, I, I don't know. Um, I would say so, and, and it, it's kind of back to the, the bugs is lacking, you know, the lack of cover. And then because of the editing when this thing's, they'll have a fantastic profile picture of you over that black void. Uh, let's see. All right, so falls like that's what we we're talking about. Yeah. And then Kerr Reservoir not having a lot of cover in it. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, back to falls. Uh, that's one place I want to spend a little more time. The only reason that I don't fish air as much as I do now is because, you know, the lack of big tournaments. That That's kind of what I've, you know, driven around, you know, trying to learn these places where a lot of big tournaments are. And um, a, another lake that I've fished a lot in this area is Heiko. And I actually just moved to Lake Gaston too. I live like 0.3 miles from a boat ramp at Holly Grove. So um, I've been here almost two months. What do you think of Gaston? Oh man, I love this place. It is a fun place to fish. Um, you know, a whole lot of people, they, they hate on the spotted bass, but I mean, at least you can go catch some. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can catch yeah. something. The the weights are better there. Gaston's weird because my family used to vacation there every now and then uh, when I was in junior and high school, and there was a ton of grass in there. The the largemouth bite was really good, and now it's like again, you know, they've nuked most of the grass, but the spots there are just bigger than Kerr's spots for some reason. Yeah, um, yeah. The last, you know, I, I've I've fished it. Like I remember it might've been a comment you put, we were talking back and forth. Yeah. Um, well, they've been in here. They've been in this like a little longer than bugs. Um, last BFL that was fished here when I was practicing for that tournament, I caught like a four pound spotted bass was like the first spotted bass I'd ever caught. Hmm. And I don't know, man, it's been like six or seven years ago. I have no idea how they got here to start with. It, 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 yeah, because like to me, it's just interesting. Like, how do they all get into that lake? And and honestly, I, I I mean, of course, spoiler warning there. They were probably introduced as how it happened. Um, but yeah, they're bigger in there. And honestly, that lake wise, I don't see why they couldn't hold bigger tournaments on Gaston. It's not terribly small. No, the lake the lake isn't. But there there's no infrastructure for it. Like there's no like big boat ramps here. How big of a boat ramp do you actually the, need? How big of one? Yeah, like like per, like I'm not saying perfect world, but like what's big enough? You would need you would need somewhere to at least park 120 to 140 boats and trailers for that's, like that's a wild. major tournament. Um, um you've got summit you've got summit boat landing, which is down at the bottom of the lake, but I. See, I think the state of North Carolina owns that and they've only they're only permitted to hold like 60 boats and trailers or something. So, you know, you can't they, they won't allow people to park up and down the road from what I'm being told. You know, it's like dirt road coming back or a little small road coming in there. It's funny because like I just guys I just Google this. So High Rock Lake, which I always has a BFL on it, is about fifteen thousand acres. Gaston's almost 21,000 acres. So it's way, way bigger. And it's just fascinating that there's no boat ramp that's big enough for a tournament on it. That's insane to me. Yeah. That like the, the BFLs used to run out of, uh, Americamps, which is, you know, a campground. And I, I'm not real sure what happened there, but you know, they, they don't launch any more tournaments out of there. Yeah, it always comes down to money. I and mean, that's something that we talked about before we got recording here. I was on the Bass Cast. Uh, go check them out too. And I was talking about it. it's just interesting. Kerr gets everything. Like even if even if there was five fish in Kerr Reservoir, they would still hold the BFL super tournaments and everything there. And it's I don't know, to me it's sad because it's like what well, what is the impetus for people to make their fisheries better if they're never gonna get tournaments, big tournaments on there? Yeah. You mentioned another uh lake too that you've been uh, dabbling with? Heiko? Yeah. Um, I actually lived on that lake for about a year. Um, that, that was, that's actually like the closest, like 
lake to where I grew up. I mean, I could be on, I could be at Heiko in like 25 minutes from where I grew up in Danville. And that's a power plant lake. Um, yeah, Heiko, Heiko is a power plant lake. Um, they, they don't use, they don't use the power plant as much as they used to. Um, they, they'll use it some in the winter time and that when they're generating water, that's when the fun, that's when it likes, I think the best. And, you know, from December to like February when they're generating water. That's so crazy. That's you got big fish in that lake now. I mean, you got Heiko, you got, um, was it Mayo Lake? Mayo's Mayo. Lake? Yeah. 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 Mayo. Um, that's, um, Mayo back in May. I probably had my personal best bass on that that I've ever physically seen with my eyes. I actually touched the fish twice, and I know it was over ten pounds. I, I got to hear the story. Uh, well, I, I I was using I was using the uh, everybody's favorite technique, the old uh, minnow pinging a minnow. Oh God! And. Yeah, <laughs> and I seen I seen the fish roaming out over like sixty foot of water, and it, it, the it, that that lake is a really good place to to learn to to learn how to see bass on a live scope because that's all that's in it is bass and crappie and bluegill. There's no other hmm. junk fish in there. So I see the fish roaming, and I throw the bait to it, and the fish is out at like sixty seventy feet, and he. The fish comes up to it and he follows it literally all the way to the boat within like 20 feet of the boat and he bites it. Mm. Well, when it, when I, when I set the hook in the fish, he runs beside of the boat and runs out behind the boat and jumps. And when he jumps, I'm like, Oh my gosh. I was like, this is a freaking giant. And it, I played it. I played her out and she come around to the boat and she, I got down in the driver's seat to land it. And I had the fish pinned against the boat the first time around and I couldn't get my hand around to get it in its mouth. And it went back out again and come back to the boat the second time. And I missed it to pin it the second time. And the third time it went out, it jumped and it come off. Oh, I was my like, God. I was, like, I was like, dude, I, it, legit. It was a legit 10 pounder. I, I've caught a lot of fish between six and eight pounds. And, and, you know, one at nine, and I know this fish was 10 pounds or better. Mm, and that's the size lake, those like 1,000 to 5,000 acre places that will have those mega, mega size fish in it too. Yeah, that, you know, and that's a, you know, it's another little, it's another little lake that, that I used to fish some um, a few years ago. And that's Farmer's Lake in Yanceyville, North Carolina. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, that place has got them too. There's some giant fish in there. Um, I tell you this, I caught the, the very first fish I ever caught off a 10 inch mag draft was in that lake and it weighed eight pounds, weighed like eight, four. Dude, that's insane. What's the biggest Look, fish you, you've ever caught? Like just fish it in general. Well, oh, green. Let's go green. I know, I know we, we could get into the redfish too here, but yeah, let's go with the green ones. Yeah. It was, um, I, I caught a fish out of a farm pond back when I was in high school and I never did put it on any type of official scale, but it weighed nine, six. I caught oh, it on a buzz bait. Dude, that's but, insane. Um, yeah, the, the, the 10 inch, a 10 inch mag draft. If you've never caught a fish on a swim bait that big, that, that bite is just, it can't be duplicated. Especially when one that big hits it. Is it big, better than a glide bait bite? Mm, like what's more addicting? Yeah. I, I like a big swim bait. I, I love throwing a swim bait anyway. That's that's one of my that's one of my go tos is a swim bait. Well, which lake helped you out the most? I and mean, we talked about Heiko, Mayo, Falls, like any of those like really did teach you some valuable lessons? I tell you, I tell you what taught me the most valuable lessons that I've learned in fishing is I fished the Toyota series last year, the central division. And 
getting away from home and going to different places. We fished uh, Gunnersville, Smith Lake, and Chickamauga, and kind of getting out on, on those places. I, I travel completely by myself, and that that's what really helped me. That I learned a whole lot last year. Or, yeah, it was last year I fished. Yeah. I mean, dude, we, we almost have to back up here. We went from you fishing a farm pond to you fishing the Toyota series. There's, there's probably some story in between there. Like, like, it, like how long have you been fishing the BFLs before? I mean, how long have you been fishing the Toyota series? Like, that's insane. I only, I fished the Toyotas. I only fished the Toyotas one year and that was last year. And, um, I've been fishing, I guess, I guess I started fishing BFLs. I think it was in 2018 when I okay. started fishing BFLs. Might have been before that. Might have been 2016. I, I can't. I can't remember. I'd have to look back and see. But um, yeah, I I learned I learned a lot last year. I never fished a I never fished a grass lake until I went to Gunnersville. And let me tell you, it was a rude awakening, buddy. <laughs> I never fished around a lot of hydrilla and grass like that. What is, as a guy that is spoiled growing up on the tidal Potomac, the flats, just grass everywhere, small lakes with grass, that's very homey to me. The, the Kerr thing took a while until I fished college tournaments when I got to Kerr, Murray, places like that where it's run and gun. Like, what was the biggest culture shock? To gra uh, grass fishing? Yeah. Uh, going in, Going into that tournament, I knew that, you know, that it, being at the time of year that, you know, from everything I'd read and learned and everything of fish, you know, they, sh you should be able to catch a good bag of fish throwing a rattle trap. Well, I show up down there and man, I have not, I do not have the right stuff to be throwing. <laughs> I learned that real quick and I'm like, goodness gracious. So I'm over there at the tackle shop. And of course, every, everything that I thought may would work, you know, sold out. I don't know, man. It was just that that place, Gunnersville, threw me for a loop for sure the first time, especially being on a big grass lake like that, never being there too. And I think it was in February. So, I mean, the fishing should have been really good, but, man, it won't for me. I, man, that place kicked my ass. Have you been to the Potomac at all or the James? I actually fished the Potomac for the first time this year. And the first time, the first time that I fished the Potomac was one of the, the Shenandoah BFL, I think was May, June. I had a pretty good finish. I mean, it, it, that, that whole Shenandoah division, I mean, it's had, you know, all those qualifying tournaments, they had 200 boats in it. And I think I finished like 36th or something. That's pretty good. The first time up there. Yeah. Um, I finished I finished third at the James a couple of weeks ago. So I've been on the James. So I, I love the James. What do you like about the James? Mm, I like fishing tidal water. I just man, it's just something different. It's it's kinda like you you know, you said it just you know, you, you grew up at the Potomac, you used to fishing it and I, I finally kinda understand how it works. It's yeah. taken me a couple of years, but you know, I, I've I've learned I learned that if you're not if you're not throwing your bait in current, you're not getting bit <laughs> at the James. That's how it works, and everybody likes going to the chick. And I've had a, you know a couple good tournaments out of the chick, but man, I like fishing the main James more. I think it, it, it's hard. I mean, I had that uh, I had that episode a couple weeks ago with Chaz and Willem who won the big ten thousand dollar tournament there, and I still think title is the biggest advantage because it's hardest to practice because unless you practice at the right tide like you could have the winning bag there and you never know it like you have to fish an area i think through the whole tide swing to know where they set up and then you, you have that memorized forever yeah and i've this this year i think i've i think i've been on a james i don't know 15 times you know, just going up there practicing and just, you know, trying to learn, trying to learn how to more or less chase the tide. And 
And I mean, you don't have to, honestly, you don't have to move really far from what, you know, what I've noticed, you know, no. 15, 20 miles, you know, which is you not re- that, you know, really not that far of a run. No, you really don't have to move. It's like, again, like, I think there's a difference. I think we have to distinguish between like mere mortals and locals. Like a local can make a 10,000 mile run and hit every stump on the third point and make that work. But for a local, I think the problem is, I'm sorry for promoting that's not a local. I think the problem is you try to duplicate that. And it's like, it's hard to beat Chaz at his own game when he has 30 years of experience, let's say. But if you just pick an yeah, area and, and camp, you, you can, you can get fat. And I think that's the issue, at least for me too, when I went to do new title bodies of water is, is not trying to milk run it, not try to do that. Just like pick a general area and just fish through the whole tide swing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, I, we fished, I guess we fished, we fished the BFL the same weekend as that, as that big tournament. And I fished from, yep, I fished from Jordan Point to Osborne. So in grand scheme of things, that really won't that far of the Appomattox. I fished the Appomattox too. So, um, you know, I just, you know, I stayed in that general area. I mean, looking at like, I mean, your BFL dude, like, I mean, you've done pretty good at the Piedmont division this year, you know, 59th in points. Um, that's, that's not bad, especially for the amount of events that you fished. Um, I mean, you qualified for the events you had to qualify for is with this and your BFL success. When did you decide? Cause and you already mentioned it earlier about Toyota series. What made you make that decision that it was time? Man, I just, man, I, the one thing is, is I just like going new places and fish. I mean, it, it sounds stupid, you know, to waste your money on going and fishing tournaments, but, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to get out and at least try it and, and see. And, you know, Gunnersville, that first tournament last year, it, it kicked my butt. But, you know, I come back on the next event at Smith Lake, and I think I finished like 30th. And I missed the I missed the cut by like one point eight pounds or something like that to fish the third day. Mm. Um, so, you know, th- it, when I when I done that, I was like, I can do this. I know I can. But, um, I don't know, man. That that, that Smith Lake tournament that, that can be a whole different subject, man. That that was a that was a crazy event right there. What was crazy about and, it? And, uh one was a weather swing man like one day it was like and this you know coleman you know kind of mid state alabama man one day one day it was like 80 degrees the next day it was raining the next day it was like 30 and the weather was just up and down and the fish were the fish were trying to come up and spawn and i think leading up to that tournament some of them guys you know they were you know the spot, the spotted bass were trying to spawn and we had that cold front. I think it come in on like a Tuesday and the tournament of course started on Thursday. Well, then it warmed back up and we went into a warming trend. Well, then fish started easing back up again. And that's back to a swim bait, man. I caught all the fish I weighed in come off of a swim bait in that tournament. And the last day of practice, I pulled into a creek. I can't even tell you the name of it. I know it's on that last river of that lake. I, I don't know. I think it's three rivers or something that feed that lake. But I pulled into a creek the last afternoon of practice, and I'm idling through this creek. And the the lake's got floating docks on it, if you've never been on it. And I'm looking under these docks, and I can see – I idle by one and I see like a four pounder sitting underneath a float on Mm. the dock. So I go to the next dock and there's another one, like four pounds sitting under a dock. I'm like, Oh man. And so I go through this Creek and man, I see, I'm just seeing fish all under these docks. And I'm like, man, I was like, I'm definitely coming back in here tomorrow. And the, my profile picture on Facebook is me holding one of those fish from the first day. I skipped a swim bait under a dock. I know I skipped it 20 feet underneath this dock, just in this little 
I skipped it thing. It was like a six inch gap and some floats and I skipped it back there. And that fish eat it on like the second crank of the handle. They end up being like a five, six or five, eight or something like that, which is a big fish on that lake. And guys, this is what we're going to do with the power of editing. His picture right now that you're seeing, it's going to be that picture. So that's the fish that we're going to be looking at right now, which is a beautiful one. Yeah, man, that was a, that was a, that was a good one. And it, the thing about that tournament is if I could have got two bites that size a day, I mean, it, you know, who knows what would have happened on the third day, but you know, I'd have been in the top five for sure if because I caught like a four eight the second day, not quite as big as the first day, but you know, I ended up missing a cut by like like I said, I think one point eight pounds or something like that. It's still a good learning experience. I mean, and I think that's the thing is like, you just have to have expectations that the chances of going in the first year, winning every single term in the Toyota series and, and moving uh, on, like it, it's, it's hard. Yeah, no, it ain't, it ain't going to happen more than likely. I mean, you never know, but getting that experience that, 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 that really did help me a lot. What did you bring back to Kerr and your other local lakes? Like that experience, was there anything in particular that stuck out to you? No, not really. And Kerr, man, I fished it. I fished it so much and so long. I, sometimes I look back on history and I, you know, I try to eliminate that. that. That's one. That's one bad habit that I have is, you know, trying to make every day a new day of fishing. And it's easy to do on somewhere that you've never been. But, you know, on on Curve, I, I mean, it's nothing really that I can think of that I brought back to to Bugs. It, it, is Bugs pretty much, once you crack it, pretty consistent in the sense of the patterns are pretty much the same, the areas are pretty much the same, or is it something you have to constantly relearn each year? Because, um, I mean, the title of the springtime. Yeah, in the um in the springtime, it's pretty predictable. Um, up until the fish come off the bed, when when they come off the bed, then they really you know it's kind of kind of hard to keep track of them, especially to catch bigger fish. But you know, from I'm gonna say November to the beginning of April is pretty predictable, unless you have some kind of crazy flood or something like we just had, which it ain't quite you know that late in the fall but you know that can really that can change up things especially when it cools off you know if you get a whole lot of rain and stuff it'll muddy the lake up you know then it's going to narrow it down just to a few areas <sighs> try to think how i word this it, 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 is the spring predictable just because it's just the pre-spawn to spawn you know what they're going to do it, is it because of what is it the water level thing a little bit of a little bit of b yeah, and and Kerr, Kerr is a very good pattern lake. Well, you can get on a pattern. You can run it almost from one end to the other at times. I mean, it, it's that good. I mean, you you catch one on a rocky point on a spinnerbait. I mean, you can go to the next rocky point and catch one on a spinnerbait. Go to the next one and the next one and the next one. And it's just, you know, a lot of times it's weeding through the smaller fish you know, to catch a bigger one, but I know I won, I won two tournaments there this past spring in March and they were both, I, there was back to back weeks and I won them both in the same area. Is that an area? And this is not, is this more of like a, so like example is mad a woman on the Potomac it, always April, there's going to be fish in there. Like a blind squirrel can find yeah. that nut. Is it that, or like you just yeah. found that this year? No, it, it, it's been year over year. Gotcha. That's interesting. It, is it true this is the hardest time of year to fish Kerr? Because in the past, I've been told, like, if they would just push these tournaments, these super tournaments, to, like, the first week of November, the fishing picks up. Man, I I, <clears throat> I got another joke about Bugs Island, and I, I'll say it like this, is I think all the fish die in it from August and come back to life in November. <laughs> that, that place can that place can kick your butt buddy i remember an aba i think it was 
Well, let me check the trophy. Uh, yeah, 18. So it was like uh, 17, 18. There was a bad hurricane that went through, so they actually postponed it uh, until it was the first week of November. And they killed it there. The crankbait bite was on fire. It was amazing. And to me, it's like, why the hell are you going there in September and October? Just wait uh, until the bite improves, and this place is not just a pit. Yeah. Yeah, it's it. September... September and October are definitely the two hardest months. I mean, by far, um, you can still, you know, at the beginning of August, you know, you can still catch fish, you know, pretty good through July and the beginning of August. And then once you get into August, it starts to really get tough. And like I said, I mean, it's, it's been fishing tough. Honestly, it's been fishing tough this week for me, but, you know, other than one good day. How much do you think the water? Um, and so when we're recording this, guys, I think the tournament, the tournament will be way past uh, when this episode drops. So when we're recording this, I think it's a, a week since the hurricane hit our area. It's been, I mean, Kerr's basically the toilet bowl. All water flushes to it. So what was the water like? Yeah. What was the water level on Monday? 304 and, and it's what, 306 now holy crap it's going up <laughs> jeez yeah let me let me check it real quick and see i looked earlier i thought i think it's right at 306 man that's insane uh, well, yeah it's insane. came up it's came up a foot it's came up a foot every day since like saturday what do you think it'll be at at the tournament uh it should start to level off um, I would say, I would say by Saturday, it would be leveled off. So you might see another foot or so because the, the inflow looked like it had slowed down today. So will so, it be in somebody's house basically on Saturday? Will it be skipping her front porch or will it be back down under 300? Oh no, it, it won't be down below 300 for another two weeks probably depending on how much water they pull it's it's actually 305.27 mm. and it's rose it's rose almost a half a foot since yesterday so so with, yeah it's five foot above full with a lake like Kerr, so we uh i had billy coles on uh earlier this week and we talked about like with a smith that's usually stationary when that water pushes up into all that fresh green stuff fish like to rush in there they're kind of it's a big feeding window for them do you think Kerr plays the same way or because it always fluctuates the fish are just kind of used to it and don't move as much yeah and and they don't they don't move as much this time of year uh, i think that's a little misconception a lot of people have with this lake especially in the fall is if the water does rise like that uh, your majority of fish won't move with it some will hmm but it's not it's not like it is in the springtime. Them fish I honestly think that them fish sit back and wait for that water to, to shoot up in the spring so they can go and bed. Hmm. I, I know in Chickamauga, I've got a I, I've got a good friend of mine that lives out there around Chickamauga and he said that if if Chickamauga doesn't rise at the right time, the the fish won't go to the bank and spawn. They, they sit there and wait for the, the water to rise in the lake before they spawn. That's fascinating. That's really, really cool. Huh. It makes sense also why the largemouth are suffering now because if, if the uh, Army Corps keeps the lake level too low for too long, it's going to stunt kind of their, their spawning cycles, which is interesting. Yeah, and it's it's been pretty inconsistent for the last couple of years. I, I know when I first started fishing it, you know, a lot, it, you know, they held the water up, you know, from March on through April and then they would drop it back down. But now it seems like when the water comes up, then it just pull it right back off. You know, it's, it's pulled yeah. right back down again. I think there's a new, there's new word on the street that they're going to try to keep it as low as at that new pool kind of area, which is, you know, sub 300 ish. And they want to keep it there as best they can, which if that's the case, how much will that actually hurt the large amount of population going forward? And without supplemental stocking, will it do any good? I, I don't, I don't know. Like 
it's just so weird how this like 10, 15 years ago, it was, you had the grass, you had higher water levels, you had large mouth. And then all of a sudden, like there was a new direction from army Corps, the home homeless. I don't know to where it's like, you know, nuke all the grass, put a hundred thousand pounds of grass carpet in there. And then we're going to keep the water level so low that the fish don't spawn. So it's like, what's, I don't know. That's a whole nother topic where I can beat on about that. It just makes no sense. Yeah. <clears throat> and I mean, another thing we hadn't talked about is it, you know, the introduction of blueback heron, you know, that that's, yeah. that's changes like a lot too. It, it has. And I don't know, like, has it hasn't it hasn't i feel like it hasn't become lake murray or hartwell yet so are the blueback no. as thick as those places yet no i don't think so and you know something else is it's in the mix too is a spotted bass now mm-hmm. you know that's you know that's gonna that's gonna come into the mix here in the next couple of years too on on bugs but I, yeah i agree Another thing about, you know, the difference, I think, between bugs and like a Lake Murray is back to the fluctuation of bugs. And another thing is, is the water don't get as clear. Mm -hmm. I I agree with that. I I think that's a a big deal. When you look at a um, a Lanier, a Hartwell, a Murray, it gets clear. It stays stable. You have these big populations of blueback. Kerr doesn't, and I really wonder how much that hurts the blueback population in there. And again, you know, the blueback population is probably newer compared to those lakes 100%, but I think there's something there where every I always hear stories of like, oh, you say the lake is bad. Well, I caught a 20-pound bag one time three years ago. It's like, but that doesn't mean the lake is good. If there's six six pounders in it, no. it, it, it doesn't mean it's like a banging lake. And it's like almost like the lake's too big for the amount of fish that's in it. It sounds weird, but... I don't, I don't know. Maybe zebra mussels would help clean it up a little bit. So there's more blue back in there or keep the water level. Like, cause Gaston again, like Gaston's got blue back in it. Gaston has spots in it and that place pops off. And the only thing I can think about is maybe it's cause the water level is just stationary there. And I think Gaston's relatively clear, right? Compared to Kerr. Well, the, water, the water clarity, it, when it's at its best at Gaston, it's about like its best at Bugs. Interesting. It's still got that green. It's still got that greenish, you know, that greenish clear color to it when it's at its best. And yet Gaston's pumping out some bags, which just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, there's no there's no hydrilla in, in Gaston anymore. I mean, it's a lot of this. Uh, what are they? Water willow bank. We call it bank grass. You know, it's a lot of that in it. I mean, hopefully it gets, the water gets high enough that it's actually like a thing that can actually play. Yeah, it, it, the, you know, the water level, you know, it stays consistent on gas and then that grass, you know, it'll grow out into, you know, three and four foot of water. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's beneficial for sure. A whole lot of, a whole lot of uh, docks on gas and too. So that's something else, you know, you can think about the difference between bugs and Gaston is, is the docks. Do you, you know, enjoy gives, fishing gives Gaston fish more? Cover. Man, Bugs Island's got my heart and probably always will. <laughs> I mean, okay, but, but tournament, no tournaments. Tournaments don't count just because you live on, on Gaston right now, correct? Yeah. Yes. So you still are like, ah, still the love is still Kerr. <sighs> Some days. <laughs> Some days, some days is like it, man. But I don't know, man. I, I just, man, I, I catch fish in a, a five gallon bucket if I thought one was That's in true. there. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it, to me, it's just the fun factor. Uh, and I guess like where I live in in Northern Virginia, Maryland, it's like I want a place that I, it's like that it has that fun factor of like, oh, hey guys, we're going to like Champlain. It's like, all right, I don't care if I win the tournament. I'm gonna have a lot of fun practicing or I'm going to go to the James or the tidal Potomac, Rappahannock river. Got to go to Rappahannock first time. The frog bite and buzz bait bite there was off the chain. It's just fun. There are other places you go. You're like, crap, this is getting a colonoscopy. (laughs) Like I've never, I've never been on a Rappahannock. Oh dude. Never been there. It's a, it's a smaller tidal river, but that's like where I can only wrote the book, but that's where they used to go in the Redmond days and stuff. And, um, there was a, a 
the Virginia MVKVA kayak trail had a tidal Rappahannock event there. And I went there and it's like, dude, this is a neat little river. Um, and it doesn't get beat up like the James or the Potomac. And it kind of reminds me what the frog fishing used to be like on the James and, and the Potomac river. Just they've never seen one before. What's it like? Does it, is it hydrilla and lily pads or? Yeah, it's a lot, trees? a lot of lily pads, a lot of, um, a lot of grass and it's, it's a lot more narrow. There's, there's portions of it that you can throw a rock across and it's deep and the current rips when it goes, it just, it moves really aggressively. Hmm. Um, yeah, it, I have a 30 volt lithium, uh, torpedo on my kayak and it, when it got going, like I had to really give it some oomph to, to go up river. So, it it's different than Potomac. Potomac rarely moves. Like it's a very gracious move, um, going low to high. Generally speaking, that place, man, it, it reminds me of like the James, where that thing rips. It, it really condenses them into areas. Hmm. Yeah, might have to. My fishing adventures may need to take me there one day just to check it out at least. Yeah, the, the places like, like that's the thing I'm getting into too. Is like I hear these places like that are back bay and like back bay supposed to be like popping um i want to go do that yeah i wanted to, i fell in love with catching like flounder and redfish this year on vacation it's like oh shit that's fun too like it's tournament fishing can blind you to like some of these other cool little places you can go and just just start smoking them left and right yeah um have you ever heard of the scubbernong river i can't even spell it, that let alone know yeah it is. It, it, yeah, it's in eastern North Carolina. It's around, um, it's, in a, it, it's down below the Roanoke River. I think it's Albemarle Sound that's part of all that. And I, I fished it last year, and that, that's kind of one of the places like you're talking about. I didn't cross it. I didn't cross that river a thousand times, and I'm like, man, I need to go fish this place. <laughs> it, was, it was fun. I'm bringing that up right now on that. That's actually really neat. That that looks a lot like kind of like the Rappahannock. It's very narrow. Yeah. Yeah. That's what reminded me of it. Oh, wow. Yeah. That place is like insanely narrow. Good Lord. Yeah. This whole area, this is the other thing too. I think because like homeowners associations suck and they're ruining so many lakes, all these tidal rivers are just getting more and more like important for fishermen. Cause there's so many that just won't be touched by, you know, people dumping, pesticides and wake boats and stuff like that. I mean, we know the chow that, you know, the chow on is, is insane right now. Yeah. I, I was a little hidden gem out there. I've never fished it, but you know, I've got some friends that have, they talk like that place is awesome. I ain't never been on it. Apparently the York river is supposed to be popping too. I had the DWR guys on giving us a little like shocking report uh, of the fish in there. And that thing's supposed to be really pumped up. It's dude, there's just so many little places that you could probably go. And especially those areas where you could like flip in. I remember when, uh, like two years ago, uh, a friend of mine, it was a bad saltwater intrusion, super drought. And he was like flipping in a quiet Creek and he set the hook and it was like a 30 pound skate where he was <laughs> freaking bass fishing. <laughs> oh my God. And he said, oh my gosh. It, it all damn near broke his reel. And it's like, I can't imagine flipping into some of these tidal water areas and you like hooking a, a freaking shark or something like that. Like, but it's possible. That's like, I was fishing, I was fishing a James a few years ago and uh, I was in the chick and out at the mouth of the chick right there where the bridge is, is some cypress trees. And I skipped up, I skipped a Cinco up under there. And God, dude, I don't know what got a hold of it, but it <laughs> bit the shank of the it bit the shank of the hook in half. No, oh I'm not God. kidding. When I it, it come off and I reeled it in, and all I had was an eyelet and a line tied on it. I said, I don't know what the hell that was, but they can have it. I said, I said, I don't want whatever that was. Yeah, I think like like Hunter and um, Hunter uh, and SB were talking like there are like sharks and dolphins that go into the chick. Like that's insane to me but i guess like the ocean is kind of like right there um yeah i guess jamestown is also like right at the freaking mouth of the chick i didn't even realize that too holy crap yeah it's insane yeah i've i don't know what that i don't know what the name of that creek is right there at jamestown but i've i've fished in there before I, I don't know what the name of it is it's a little it's a bridge that you go under and you can idle and go all the way back in there. I have no Sandy idea Bay what it's called. And back mm. river. 
It's yeah, dude. Like th- this is why this place gives you such a freaking home field advantage. The James. It's like there's so many damn little ass creeks. It, it Potomac's easy. There's like five bays. We all know where you're fishing. It, it's it, one of the five bays will produce fish. Period. Done. It, this place. <laughs> yeah. It's so many little nooks and crannies you have to go to explore. Yeah, that's that's why, you know, that, that's one reason why I spent, you know, as much time up there this year. Um, I mean, it, it it's hard to believe for me, but I didn't fish. I think the last time I fished Bugs Island was in May, and I didn't fish it again until August. And I was just, you know, I was at the Potomac, I was at the James, and, you know, I was staying at places like that, you know, trying to learn a little bit. Do you, because you've lived there so long, do you even, like, do you delete waypoints at the end of the year and rediscover waypoints? Or do you, like, download waypoints, keep them on a computer so you don't, like, have overload when you open up your GPS unit at the tournament? Yeah, I've I've started deleting them. Um some of them, you know, this is shame on me but for, for not naming it. You know, I'll put a waypoint down and, and not name it. And, you know, a year or two goes by and you're like, what in that, what, is, what the hell waypoint is this? You got to have it and recheck it. And be like, oh, this must have been some of that junk. You just delete it and go on past your date. Uh, I actually done some of that this week. Yeah, like that's something right. too. It's like perfect world. Like that's what you. Re- I, I get it. I get it. You watch the YouTube videos. Like you got to organize it, barcode that shit because you don't want to have like. I, I went through my unit. Uh, was it last week and started deleting stuff off there to make the processor work a little bit better. But there are some places I looked at. I was like, oh my god! Like I can't even see the damn water. I have way too many. Do I really need all these freaking waypoints? Man, I um, yeah, Kerr. Uh, the the current boat that I have, I bought it in 2021, and I think I put right at 100 hours of idling on her. Dang. And at, I ain't even going. I want to tell you that I probably got anywhere from three to 400 brush piles marked on that lake. Mm. Something like that. And it, they don't all produce fish, that's for sure. <laughs> I learned that. Do you but, color code them no. or just brush pile one, brush pile two, all the way up to 300? Yeah, see, I run helixes, so, man, it's kind of, that's one thing. It, I wish I would have got solixes on mine with a touch screen. That way it'd be yeah. a little easier because, you know, with a helix, you have to sit there and pan back and forth on the keypad, to, and yeah. it just takes so long. I agree and with that. The next boat I get, I'll get Selig uh, you know, I'll get Solixes on my next boat, probably. I'm trying to figure out whether I want to do that or go with, like, just pure Garmin or add some Lorraine. Like, I, I don't know. that. Like I hate Hummingbird's GPS mapping. Like, when it comes to, like, waypoint storage, it's just not as good. Um, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm the only reason I want it is for 360 at this point, honestly, because I think the side scan is good on all three units now. Like, it's pretty good. Like, it's very small differences i think compared to like five or six years ago when hummingbird was clearly the best you uh do you use lake master Matthew? yeah i use lake master yeah see i like mine man i i i, I think it's about as accurate as any of them that lake master plus the mapping is good but it's just like on my college boat i had lawrence and so it's so much easier to be like okay this is rock pile you know 36 or whatever and you could organize it to where i could tell with the different graphs and stuff with my little autism brain like okay this is what i'm going to hit first versus hummingbird it's a lot harder to make it distinguish blobs i guess on the screen yeah yeah that that makes sense i think i'm up to and this is for every lake that I've been to. I think I'm up around 3,000 waypoints. Jesus. Something like that. Can you and download them that, off your unit? Yeah. I, I Every once in a while, I'll t- I've got a memory card and I'll back them up. Good. You know, you know, I back up and I keep it in. I, hung, I got a, a special peg in my tackle room that <laughs> I keep that damn memory card on. I was going to say, that thing's probably more valuable than Bitcoin. 
I don't know. I don't know if you can use mine to catch any fish or not, but it, it's got a whole lot of it's got a whole lot of waypoints on it, and they're spread out all over the place. Yeah, and that's again, that's just something that's so interesting there, especially with all the stuff going around in fishing about like using other people's stuff. But it, like, even if it's marked, it doesn't mean that you're going to show up there, you know, tournament wise and use it because you still have to have an idea of when that brush pile will hit or oh, yeah. graph it beforehand. It's not you just show up and catch them off of somebody else's brush pile. Oh, no, it doesn't work like that. I mean, you could go over there and fish the same brush pile 50 times in a day. It don't mean you're going to catch a damn fish off of it. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, um, yeah, it's the, the drama in fishing. I, I wish we could just get back to fishing. Yeah. I do too. I think social media, like the Twitter and Facebook thing has really hurt it with the comment section. And I don't know, it'll be interesting to see what happens next year with the new rules and stuff for, um, for forward facing sonar and how that affects everything. Yeah. The MPFA, you know, they, they just went on and, and got rid of it. I, I'll be, I, I'm interested to see how that, that shakes out. Yeah, me too. Um, I just, the poor BFLs, man, they're hurting. They're really hurting right now. And and I just, there's so many things with the cat series, with the elite 70 there, there's so many more opportunities for you to make money versus hopping in a BFL. So it's like, why would you, if the payouts are going to suck? Yeah. And I like this, this year in particular, you know, at first I was just going to cherry pick some BFL, especially the ones like on, uh, bugs and stuff at the beginning of the year, but then when that, you know, when we found when I found out the regional was was here, I was like, I gotta at least try to make it to that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, man. I I'm I'm thinking about I'm thinking about doing like cherry picking next year and maybe trying the Toyotas again. I may I may do the Northerns this time though. I mean, the Northerns. I think there's more of a fun factor because you get to go up to you know, smallmouth Disneyland and places like that. Um, I don't know. I just, I like chasing the brown ones personally. A lot more fun. Those other lakes yeah. are just so pressured. A Smith Lake, like, I mean, good Lord. Those places get beat to hell. Yeah, I fished, um, I fished St. Lawrence. I guess it's been about five years ago. I've never been to Champlain, but I have been on St. Lawrence and I'm, I'm ready to go back up there and look around. Yeah, it's it's good to learn that kind of style of fishing. It's fun. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, there's nowhere. I there's a bunch of places I feel like around here you can go to mimic Smith Lake. You could go to a fill pot. You could go to a place a Clater Lake, a place that like it's going to be tough, clear water. There's no place around here you can really go to mimic the St. Lawrence or Lake Champlain. No. Have you ever been on Holston, South Holston? That's a bucket list place. I really want to go there. Man, that place is awesome. You, you need to you need to go on down there and check it out. It, it's like another one of those places, man. It's like if it was any bigger, it'd get attention from everybody else because it's so tiny. No one cares about it. Yeah, it, they they will hold BFLs and stuff there, but that's about it. And nobody, you know, and no, I don't think there's ever been a major trail that that's fished that lake that I know of. Let's take a look. See, I think it is five thousand acres. No, it's almost eight thousand acres. Boom! So it's it's almost the size of a uh, Lake Anna. That's crazy. That's one place I've never been. I've never been to Lake Anna. Lake Anna is a weird cat because it's it's technically bigger. It's almost bigger than High Rock, but then there's that private section. So it's it's like 95, 98 acres of public. And then you have like three major creek arms that some idiot decided to put uh, a dike across. So if they would nuke that and get rid of it, or if there's a massive, it would be cool. There's actually a massive flood event to hit that lake. It would be big <laughs> enough. You could have a, a BFL. I know. Right. Yeah. I don't know if that's good in taste or not, but I don't care. I said it. The place drops 30 pounds. They're pumping F1s in there like crazy the last five years. So it's going to get better weight wise. Um, it's it's a neat little lake. It really is. I just wish it was a little bit bigger and it'd probably get a little bit more attention and love. That lake's a power plant lake too, ain't it? Yep. 
so the half that's private is the nuclear side. And then the other wow. half is public because apparently Virginians thought that was weird to have. I, I don't know. I, I really need to figure out the history of why they decided to cut that lake into two different lakes like that. It's it's really freaking weird. Hmm. Yeah, see, I don't know much about it. I know I know it's a lot of good I know it's a lot of good fishing there though. I see the tournament results from there. It it pumps them out because it's got so much bait in it, dude. It's got so much shad in there compared to a lot of lakes around the area. But again, it's just and it's hold like a <coughs> it's held like a two hundred and fifty or almost a two hundred boat tournament before, not two fifty. So it can absorb it. And I honestly this is such a weird tinfoil thing. I think people get spoiled with the size of like you actually need to have a tournament I, I really do i don't think you need a hundred thousand acre place to have a 200 boat tournament um watching 200 boats take off at lake anna last year and it, it absorbs it because it has so many fingers and shit and so i think an eight thousand acre lake something like that it, it can easily easily take something like that it doesn't have to be cur size like gaston perfect that would work well if we had the facilities yeah i don't know exactly how big like gas is I Twenty thousand, probably i was gonna say around 20 to 25 high rock is 15 exactly. oh yeah <laughs> good old good old high rock that, that's a that's a place i love to eat well because it's got five It'll fish in it but there. they're all six pounds yeah, yeah that, that's that's a very good description of that place. I, I don't, it's such a weird, <clears throat> I don't get it. Like, it's such a weird lake where there's just not a lot. It doesn't feel like there's a lot of fish in it too, but it's like, it's like the reverse of Kerr that like Kerr doesn't have a lot of big fish in it, but it's got a ton that are 10 inches long. There, there's like six a and it's just so funky. Yeah, that. From what I know about that place, you 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 about fish shallow year round. Because the water the water stays so screwed up there. I, I, you know, at its best, it might get three or four foot of visibility down around a dam, but it just you know water stays dirty there. That's the majority got, yeah. of the time. If it had some lily pads or some grass in there, it would really pop off. Oh yeah, it's. It's definitely some big fish in that place. <clears throat> Is it? I mean, I guess there's no Alabama bass in there, are there? No, no, not that I know of. I, I hadn't been to it. I hadn't been to High Rock. It's, I guess, it's the third year I haven't been there. But no, I don't think it's any spot of bass in there. Yeah, I think it's just largemouth too. Oh, I have to talk about. Yeah, I mean, since I have you on here, I got to talk about your redfish bed. Where'd you go for that? Yeah, I caught that. Uh, we were at Nags Head. Um, we go, we go the same week every year, and man, we we usually get on them about every time we go. If we don't catch them in Nags Head, we we get in the truck and we go find them. Mm. So we'll, we'll go to Buxton, you know, Avon, Avalon. Been all the way up to Duck chasing them before. So, but we we caught those in Nags Head. Dude, that's freaking awesome. That's something that I'm definitely going to be doing here in the future, probably next year, is doing some specific trips to go chase some reds and stuff. Um, while I have on here, uh, again, guys, we're doing some post predictions because this is going to come out probably in a week or two. Uh, what do you think is going to happen this weekend at Kerr? Weight-wise, what are you thinking? Somebody's going to catch a big bag one of the days. Somebody's going to have 18 or 19 pounds at least one one of those days somebody's gonna catch a bag that big but i, I think consistency is gonna gonna win the battle if, if you can catch 14 15 a day you you're gonna be in the mix on it what do you think the lowest weight you need to like cash a check let's see i think it's 158 boats in it <sighs> I need to look at the regional payouts. I, I don't. I can't I'm, remember what they. I can't remember what they pay. I don't know if they pay a percentage or, or what they do. I'm thinking eight pounds a day. 
nine pounds? Mm, mm, I would say I would say twenty three pounds for two days will get the last check. Ooh. Yeah. So eleven point five. Okay. Okay. It's a, if you can do anything, usually you can catch 10 or 11 pounds at, at bucks. That's, that, that might be about as good as you're going to get. But you, most of the time, you can catch that. That's so sad. I don't know. It just feels so depressing. <laughs> hmm. I, I don't know. Like I said, man, somebody, somebody might figure them out up shallow, you know, because the, the two big fish that I've caught this week have been shallow. But it's the only two fish I've caught up shallow. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's been a grind on the bank. Even with the water up, it's still grinding. Will down lake clear up before up lake will, or will up lake clear up? It's still it's still clear on the lower end. Uh from from about Ivy Hill down, I mean it looks good. Well it, it'll it, Sometimes, man, and it depends on the time of year, and I think water temperature's got a lot to do with it, is you'll, you'll have a bunch of mud coming that place, and the mud line will be, like, in the middle of the lake. It'll The upper part will clear up, and the lower part will clear up, and all the mud's trapped in the middle. It's hmm. weird. I've seen it. I've seen it multiple times. And sometimes it'll just muddy the whole place up, especially in the wintertime. Really? Yeah. Yeah, you nut bush, nut bush will stay, you know, fairly clean, and then like your longer creek arms, like you know, butchers and roads, it'll stay clean and grassy will clean up in the middle as well. And that'll be in the winter, you know. That's weird. That's so interesting how that place fills up. That grassy man, I've had some memories in grassy before. Whew. Dang. Dude, I, I really can't thank you enough for coming on. We, we, we've weathered Elon Musk's uh, internet uh, to be able to get this thing yeah. done. Um, I, I, I don't know. I have a good feeling for you this weekend. It's going to be a tough tournament, but I think you're going to be able to, to be able to duke it out. Is this your last big tournament of the year, or do you have something else coming up? No, this is it for me. Um, I'll probably, after this, I'll probably take a couple weeks off tournament fishing, and then I'll, I'll probably jump in some of these cat trails and stuff for the fall. That's, that's going to be about it for me for this year. Uh, that sounds like a lot of fun. Is, is there anything in sponsor wise or anything else like that that we can promote for you here? Um, well, honestly, just myself, uh, bad customs tackle. Um, I make, you know, I custom make a lot of handmade tackle, uh, jigs and spinner baits and all kinds of different various jig heads. And I think the last time I looked, I've got like, 52 lead molds that I can pour. So, I mean, I, I can just about pour any kind of lead bait now. Oh, wow. Dude, that's freaking awesome. I didn't know that. How long have you been doing that for? <sighs> really took off back in, uh, back, you know, when COVID started. But, um, I don't know. I started making jigs, I don't know, probably 2016, 2017. Damn. Something like that. And, and then you just check, expanded. Go check me out on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I'll uh, put a link in there. Um, yeah, man, like all of I got a, my jig box in my boat weighs 60 pounds. I mean, I hadn't bought a jig in 10 years, <laughs> almost. Well, you know what we're going to do? Let us, um, we'll do a, I got a great idea. Let's do a jig fishing show uh, in early November and we can just, pimp out your tackle and stuff we'll figure we'll beta test the internet but we'll uh pimp out your products and we can just talk jigs sweet yeah the jig might be good then anyway yeah so that, that'd be a good thing guys if you're listening right now uh, i'll put a link in the episode description to his facebook page if you want to try to check out his jigs and then we're going to schedule a a show for the future where we'll just completely just talk jigging jig fishing everything jig fishing um ben again i think can't thank you enough for coming on i really appreciate it good luck at the super tournament at kerr after the hurricane came through as always guys link in the episode description to everything that you talked about if you'd like to join my patreon members a fishing tournament it's going to start october 12th you have to be a patreon member to sign up it goes from october 12th through halloween evening with a kind of cool prizes like and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next time on fishing the dmv bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your host, Thomas Ahrens. 
Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.